Hello students, this is a very special session on clinical cases. I am Dr. Minakshi Sundaram A.S. MBS MD with 11 years of experience in the field of competitive exams and this is an academy for you and you can crack NEET PG with India's largest learning platform and these are the different things that you can get from an academy. The subscribers to an academy have access to daily live classes. Every single day you'll have classes and you have structured courses, you have live tests and quizzes and you have unlimited access to many more than you can expect. And you can use my referral code Dr. ASMYT to get 10% off on your subscription. And there are multiple revision courses going on. So let me begin with the special discussion session in biochemistry. Generally, we keep running behind a lot of MCQs, but more than the MCQs, let us try to understand the core concepts in case of clinical discussion when it comes to the basic science subjects like biochemistry. Let me show you an example of a case discussion here. Go to the case here. An elderly male presents with anemia, weight loss, and passage of bulky pale stools. On examination, he had hepatosplenomegaly. His plasma electrolytes were normal. Further lab tests are revealing total proteins to be 5.2 grams per deciliter, albumin being 2.5 grams per deciliter and you have calcium, not deciliter, liter. Calcium is 6.8 milligrams per deciliter, phosphate is 2 milligrams per deciliter. Alkaline phosphatase level is 300 units per liter. His fetal fat excretion was done. Why? Vitamin D levels if tested, how will they be? Explain the concepts behind the finer points of the case. So take this as a real time condition. If at all an elderly male has reported to your own OPD or to your emergency department, how would you approach it? First, this is to be doing with the physical examination showing you hepatosplenomegaly. Also, the patient is presenting with anemia. The patient is exhibiting weight loss. There is passage of bulky pale stools. Here, we can begin with one single point. When there is a passage of bulky and yet pale stools, it means the color of the stools, which is golden yellow to brown, has been altered. It means the pale color can be because of fat. So that would mean to say that the patient can have steatorrhea. Try to bombard the last statement here. His fecal fat excretion was done. Why? Because I think that there might be fat passing through the stools, making the stools bulky and pale. That is why I want to quantify how much amount of fat has been excreted in the fecal material of his. So if at all I try to quantify, if the concentration of the fat is high in the fecal material, it can go along with my thought process that the patient is having a condition called as steatoria. Assuming my statement is correct, steatoria is a condition where there is malabsorption of fat and that can be related to other kind of absorptions becoming defective also. For example, the fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E and K will not be absorbed properly because they require proper kind of bile and emulsification for that to happen. At the same time, protein absorption can also get defective. So protein malabsorption, lipid malabsorption, even carbohydrate malabsorption is possible. I'm not saying it is definitely there, but it is possible. So when that is the condition, the vitamin deficiency can give you lesser and lesser amount of nutrition. When the nutrition is lesser, then metabolic pathways can come to a grinding halt. Why? Because in nutrition, the vitamins are the most important coenzymes that are related to a lot of biochemical reactions. Among A, D, E and K, K is the only fat soluble vitamin who can act as a cofactor for carboxylase enzymes and like for example vitamin K epoxy reductase kind of activity. Here you have to understand whenever the patient is having decreased nutritional absorption then he can have weight loss. Why can there be anemia? Anemia can easily be because of iron malabsorption. Iron malabsorption can happen in this patient and this patient may be having a hereditary or an acquired type of malabsorption disorder. He may have any kind of intestinal abnormality especially in the ileum, didunum and the jejunum not majorly in the large intestine. Now look at the electrolyte value. Electrolyte values are normal. So fluid imbalance is not a problem here. He had hepatosplenomegaly, right? That is why I am going to ask myself why exactly proteins are low. Proteins are supposed to be between 6 to 8. If it is 5.2, they are moderately lesser. Albumin has gone even lesser than that of 3. So protein is lesser because of poor absorption. Also remember, when albumin levels are lesser, calcium automatically goes down. And that calcium is going down because of one more concept that I told you A, D, E and K, all four can be going for malabsorption. So vitamin D levels are supposed to be less than normal. Now look at this. If I go for alkaline phosphatase, 
Alkaline phosphatase elevation is definitely expected when calcium levels are low. Now look at the next slide here is an extension of the previous case. The fecal fat excretion was found to be 55 grams over 3 days, not over 1 day. Over 3 days the patient is losing 55 grams of fat. What is the normal loss of fat in 3 days? It is 21 grams. So approximately twice or more than twice of fat loss. So this is confirming my condition that my suspicion that it can be a steatoric state. Also remember his plasma 25 hydroxycholecalciferol is coming down. That is normal values between 40 to 160 nanomoles per liter but the patient is having 28. Why are you going for 25 hydroxycholecalciferol? Remember in case of vitamin D synthesis we start with the skin. In the skin the ergosterol is actually being opened up. That is, the cholesterol in the skin has been opened up, then becomes cholecalciferol. The cholecalciferol is ending with a letter called as OL. OL means it already contains a hydroxy group, to which when it goes to the liver, there is an enzyme called as 25 hydroxylase, which will add the hydroxy group to the 25th carbon in the cholecalciferol. So now I have two OH groups. From there, it goes to the kidney. In the kidney, you have one hydroxylase enzyme, which will attach the hydroxy group to the first carbon. So I have on the first position, on the 25th position and the naturally occurring hydroxy group of the cholecalciferol. So it is called as triol which is referred to as calcitriol. Remember calcitriol is the most active form of vitamin D but the most abundant form of vitamin D is 25 dihydroxy, I mean dihydroxy vitamin or calcidiol. Calcidiol is having two hydroxy group. So when I say 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol, there is a OL here, there is a OH here, so it is a diol. Calcidiol is the one that you try to measure. So remember, whenever you suspect vitamin A deficiency, the marker you have to look for would be plasma 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol, which is nothing but calcidiol. I repeat, the most active form is calcitriol. So you understand, vitamin D is deficient. When vitamin D is deficient, because of vitamin D helping you absorb calcium, the calcium levels are lesser. Let me erase all the annotations that I have written here. In this point of concern here, I understand because of vitamin D deficiency, three things are failing. What is the function of vitamin D? Reabsorption of calcium from the kidney. From the GIT, it helps in the absorption of calcium. In the bone, it helps in the resorption of calcium. So in all possible ways, calcium level can be elevated in the presence of vitamin D. Also remember, vitamin D is stimulated by another hormone called as parathormone. Here parathormone is not abnormal, but vitamin D is low because of which calcium levels are low. At the same time, when the calcium levels are falling, you have alkaline phosphatase getting into the act because of which alkaline phosphatase levels are elevated. Now at this point of time, GGT is not mentioned, AST is not mentioned, ALT is not mentioned. It means they are supposed to be abnormal, so it is not a problem of the liver, it's a problem of the GIT alone. So this is a case or classical case of steatoria where the patient is suffering from nutritional malabsorption. So this is the theory part. You can read it whenever you feel like. Out of this, I can tell you one thing. Vitamin B12 absorption test can become positive because the patient may be having regional enteritis because of which he's having steatoria because of which vitamin B12 deficiency can be seen. Also remember, poor vitamin D can lead to activation of osteoblasts, which will be the reason for increased ALP level. Let's look at the next question. This is the clinical case scenario. This is a different case scenario. Look at it. Serum blue ribbon level is 9 mg percentage. Conjugated blue ribbon is 7.5 mg percentage. Unconjugated blue ribbon is 1.5 mg percentage. This is also elevated. This is also elevated. More of conjugated blue ribbon and less of unconjugated blue ribbon elevation. See, both of them are not normal. Unconjugated blue ribbon is slightly elevated, but conjugated blue ribbon is extremely elevated. SGOT levels and SGPT levels are just two times the high normal level called as 40 international units per liter. So, ALP levels are taken care of. ALP level is 140 King Angstrom units, while urine bile salts are positive and bile pigments are positive, while urobilinogen is negative and fecal stercobilinogen is negative. How do you discuss this case? This is a classical case of obstructive jaundice. For that, let me show you a table. Look at this. 
if this is hemolytic jaundice or hepatocellular jaundice or obstructive jaundice this would be the parametrical change now let us focus only on obstructive jaundice what happens in obstructive jaundice there is an obstruction to the flow of bile because of which bile is not able to enter into intestine so the bile is actually containing conjugated bilirubin that conjugated bilirubin is capable of entering into the intestine but it is not allowed so the conjugate bilirubin jumps into the blood in the blood conjugate bilirubin will start increasing and that conjugate bilirubin through the blood can enter into the kidney and comes out in the urine so in the urine urine bilirubin can be normally formed so blood free bilirubin is actually normal but conjugate bilirubin is increased and blood alp is very high because it is obstruction what happens here if this is a hepatocyte between two hepatocytes you will be having biliary canalicular epithelial cell the canalicular epithelial cell will be containing ggt and alp when there is obstruction the stony obstruction or bile extra pressure can pressurize the canaliculi the canaliculi can start releasing ggt or alp because of which alp can be elevated now look at the urine urine is already containing conjugated bilirubin now the urine bile salts are definitely present and urine conjugated bilirubin is also present why because it went through the blood through the blood it went to the kidney from the kidney it came out into the urine so in the urine bile salts and conjugated bilirubin can be present but what cannot be present in the obstructive jaundice if at all the conjugated bilirubin did not enter into the intestine there was no chance of deconjugating the bilirubin into urobilinogen and that urobilinogen can become that is whatever bilirubin that was deconjugated can get converted into urobilinogen or stercobilinogen in the git and both of them will be lesser because of which urine bilinogen is not formed you fecal urobilinogen is not present at all because the fecal urobilinogen and urine urobilinogens are absent the urine can be colorless at the same time the fecal material can be the i mean sorry the urine can be high colored because the presence of conjugated bilirubin while the fecal bilirubin can be absent because of which it can be clay colored stools clay colored stools the color for the urine is not offered by the bilinogen but since i told you the urine contains bilirubin conjugated bilirubin it can give you the urine's color but the fecal material can be clay colored this is an indication for obstructive jaundice look at the question paper once again urobilinogen is negative and that is not giving any kind of color to the urine but fecal stercobilinogen is negative that is why you have clay colored stools so whenever you look at these questions you should be able to identify the clay colored stools as a part of your clinical or investigative examination in terms of tests so look at this urine bile salts are positive because it went through the blood into the kidney into the urine so this is how we try to crack a uh, obstructive jaundice case hello students let us discuss a unique case here patient 1 is presenting at 3 months of age with excessive irritability abnormal posturing since birth and delayed developmental bile stools there is a history of sibling death at the day 15 of life the clinician reported abnormal urine odor lab analysis revealed ketonuria and metabolic acidosis remember there is a difference in the words called as ketosuria and ketonuria why in ketose urea the keto sugars are coming in the urine which can be either fructose or it can be sucrose there you call it as keto sugar ketose urea but ketone urea means ketone bodies are coming out in the urine like acetone acetoacetate beta hydroxybutyrate etc so clinician reported abnormal urine odor lab analysis revealing ketone urea and metabolic acidosis hplc is done hp analysis of amino acid is showing elevated levels of leucine isoleucin valine that makes me think what is common between leucine isoleucin and valine we can remember very well from the amino acid chemistry that valine isoleucin and leucine will are branched chain amino acids so you understand that hplc analysis is done on the urine where amino acid levels are elevated so this is a case of branch chain amino acid elevation but all the branch amino acids are not exactly seen as proper amino acids in the urine the child has died immediately afterwards now i am in a shock i want to see there is an abnormality in branch amino acid metabolism the child has died now look at patient 2 
patient 2 is similar to patient 1, but these are the differences. Patient 2 presented at day 12, while you understand patient 1 presented at 3 months of age, while patient 2 is presenting at day 12 of age. And day 12 is showing you metabolic acidosis, abnormal urine odor, ketonuria, hepatocytic megaly. The same kind of clinical features or similar features are seen in the second patient also. Now look at this. Blood and urine studies are revealing elevated levels of valin, isoleucine, leucine. This is also telling me an abnormally elevated branch chain amino acids, right? But aggressive treatment was started including branch amino acid restricted diet and supplementation. Patient has survived 3 years of age without any episodes of exacerbation afterwards. Levels of leucine, isoleucine and valin came down to normal. So now let me erase all the annotations I have written here. Look at the case history once again. Patient 1 and patient 2, both are having similar picture, but patient 1 presented at the end of 3 months of age, while patient 2 presented at day 12 of presentation. And please remember, patient 1 had a history of sibling who died at 20, day 15 of its life. So, it was not 15 days until which the patient 2 has come. The patient 2 has come 3 days earlier and the symptoms are matching each other. At the same time, HPLC analysis is also matching that. Leucine, isoleucine, valin, all 3 are elevating. So, you understand, urine odor is abnormal. In the metabolic pathway of branched chain amino acids, the disease that comes to my mind would be maple syrup urine disease. Maple syrup urine disease, which is referred to as MSUD. Now, how exactly can we deal with MSUD or what do we understand about MSUD? Look at the case. Diagnosis is maple syrup urine disease. In case of first patient, diagnosis was delayed and hence treatment could not be started earlier, baby died. But in the second case, the diagnosis and treatment was started early, outcome was better. So, this is a case history to show you if at all there is an early identification presentation of a child and easy understanding then there is a very good possibility of chasing and saving a lot of children at the earliest let us discuss about maple syrup urine disease this is taken from vasudevan's textbook so remember this will be helpful for you to answer mbbs questions also along with that of entrance exam question the proteins from food and proteins from muscles can break down to give me branch chain amino acids and if the branch chain amino acid developing enzyme or metabolizing enzymes are normal they can be broken down to give me energy and growth but if those enzymes are defective, then buildup of branch amino acids can happen. That is why when I try to test using HPLC, all the all the vitamins like I mean the branch chain amino acids like valin, isoleucine, and leucine were elevated. Here you will not see any elevation. Why? Because they are broken down at regular intervals and they are importantly used for growth and energy. But here they are not used. So buildup of branch amino acid is not helping you in the growth. So growth can be stunted. At the same time, they can be toxic to the body also. Let us look at the pathway here. We start with valin or leucine or isoleucine. What is the first step? The first step is going for transamination to produce branched chain alpha keto acid. You are converting valin and amino acid into corresponding keto acid called as isovaleric acid. So remember valin on deamination or transamination can give you alpha keto isovaleric acid. Leucine can give you alpha keto isocaproic acid. Isoleucine will give you alpha keto beta methyl valeric acid. Here it is isovaleric acid. Here it is valeric acid. Why am I discussing this table? Because this table is mostly ignored by many students. But if you look at it, it is not such a very painful kind of table to understand and learn. You can love it if at all you try to compare and contrast all the three amino acids at the same level. So we start with valin or isoleucine or leucine. If it is valin, it gives you isovaleric acid. If it is leucine, it gives you isocaproic acid. If it is isoleucine, it gives you valeric acid with a proper keto group in the whole structure. Now you go for oxidative decarboxylation with the help of CoA, NAD, branch in alpha keto acid dehydrogenase lacking in the maple syrup urine disease. What exactly it means? You might have heard about pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. You would have heard about alpha ketoglutrate dehydrogenase complex. One other similar complex is branched chain keto acid dehydrogenase complex. What is common to all the three complexes? In all the three complexes, you have three enzymes plus five vitamins. The five vitamins are B1 in the form of thiamine pyrophosphate, B2 in the form of FAD, B3 in the form of NAD, you have pantothenic acid which is B5, you have lipoic acid. Now, in case of the three enzymes, in PDH complex, one of the enzymes is pyruvate dehydrogenase. In alpha KGDH, one of the enzymes is alpha KGDH itself. In branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase, one of the enzymes is branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase itself. But the other enzymes are 
dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase and dihydrolipoyl transacetylase. So, these two enzymes and five coenzymes are common to all the three. The only difference is the PDH enzyme is present in PDH complex, alpha KGDH enzyme is present in alpha KGDH complex and BCKADH enzyme is present in BCKADH complex. Now, if a patient is having B1 deficiency or B2 deficiency or B3 deficiency or B5 deficiency or lipoic acid deficiency, this decarboxylation step does not happen. When alpha keto isovaleric acid is knocked off with the carbon dioxide, it gives me isobutyl CoA. The same happens in leucine to give me isovaleryl CoA. The same happens in isoleucine to give me alpha methyl butyl CoA. And the next step is FRA dependent dehydrogenation, which is oxidation. Isobutyl CoA will give me methyl acrylyl CoA, isovaleryl CoA will give me beta methyl crotonyl CoA, and alpha methyl butyl CoA will give me tiglyl CoA. The remaining things can be slightly more overwhelming for you. But my point here is from the conversion of the transamination step, I'll erase all the annotations here. From this particular step, that is when iso alpha keto isovaleric acid is supposed to become isobutyl CoA or alpha keto isocaproic acid becoming isovaleryl CoA or alpha keto beta methyl valeric acid becoming alpha methyl butyl CoA is just like pyruvic acid becoming acetyl CoA or your alpha keto glutaric acid becoming succinyl CoA. What is the one thing you have to understand in pyruvic acid? We have a three carbon acid, but acetyl CoA is a two carbon CoA. Alpha ketoglutric acid is a five carbon acid. Succinyl CoA is a five carbon CoA. So when a three carbon becomes two carbon, you have a loss of carbon. When five carbon becomes a four carbon, there also you have a loss of carbon. Likewise, when alpha keto isovaleric acid is becoming isobutyl CoA, one carbon dioxide is lost. Here also one carbon dioxide is lost. Here also one carbon dioxide is lost. The most important enzyme here is just like PDH complex or alpha KGDH complex, the most important enzyme complex here is branched chain keto acid dehydrogenase complex which when deficient can produce accumulation of alpha keto isovaleric acid, alpha keto isocaproic acid, alpha keto beta methyl valeric acid in respective amino acid metabolism which will be giving you the burnt sugar smell and that is referred to as maple syrup urine disease. So in this case condition the reason for abnormal odor was the burnt sugar because of the abnormal keto acids being developed. HPLC analysis is showing elevated levels of these because these amino acids are not properly metabolized and you may have ketone urea. The ketones are coming out in the urine because you saw the keto acids. What were the keto acids we saw here? We saw alpha keto isovaleric acid, alpha keto isocaproic acid, alpha keto beta, methyl valeric acid coming out in the urine. This is a classical case of maple syrup urine disease. And this is how we discuss the case. Patient 1 came early, patient 2 came late because of which we were not able to save patient 1 but patient 2 was savable. So early diagnosis and treatment can save a lot of children from a lifetime of suffering and death. Thank you very much.